Hey y'all, this is Pastor Mike. I got my coffee. Let's talk leadership. Today we want to go into chapter two in our book, in, in, in the life of Moses, our book, of The Heart of a Leader. Now, I want to remind you, we talked about five stages of leadership last time. Learning to be, learning to, to make a difference, learning to give direction, learning to build structure, and learning to leave a movement. All of these stages, as we go through our lives, we must start with learning to be, but then we begin to make a difference in the world. We begin to, we begin to see that we can, we can accomplish things and we can change things. But then we begin to give direction. Once you've made a difference a few times, folks will let you direct them. Folks will let you say, hey, let's go that direction, and they'll start following you. Then you build structure. The structure is what allows you to continue to see this thing outlive you or outperform you as you build the structure. The structure allows what you are doing to become exponential in its impact. And then learning to leave a movement, learning to leave behind something that will outlive you for generations or in Moses' case, for thousands of years. Now, what we are going to do is we're going to be working with this chart. And I'm going to leave this chart here the entire time we're teaching because some of you are going to want to write this down. Some of you are going to want to draw this out. And what I'm going to do is we're going to deal with each line. You see the different colors in the lines here. We're going to deal with each line. Those are going to be the points we teach. And we're going to teach this from the standpoint of God has created each of us to care about, to lead in, to do different things. God has created each of us to see different things. And so I want to unpack that. But I want to begin by saying this. Different is not a matter of better and worse. It's just a matter of different. So as we go through these things, you might find one that you think, that's the main goal. That's the one I want to be. That's what I want to do. Hold on. Hold on. No, no, no. You got to be who God made you to be. You can't be somebody else. You just have to be who God made you to be. Let me take you back to Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, where we were last week. Now a man from the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. This son is Moses. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. When she saw that he was a fine child. Listen, we are all born fine children. The question is, can we find that purpose, that meaning, that direction, that call on our lives that God has put there? And can we understand and accept the fact that God has designed us specifically for some specific type of ministry? And if we try to perform in somebody else's area outside of our strength, we're not going to be able to get that done. Now, I want to show you some things on the chart here. You, you, you see we start broken for A. I believe that one of the greatest ways to discover how God made you, what God called you to do, is to ask yourself this question. By the way, great leadership and great learning is really based in finding great questions. Here's a great question. So let me give you this great question that will help you determine where you should be putting your energy. What does my heart break for? Listen, the things that break your heart will drive you to action. Now, I don't mean like you're sitting in front of the TV and and, and they have some sad commercial for puppy dogs and the, that lady singing in the arms of the angels. I, that's not what I'm suggesting. That, that, that moment is just an emotional moment brought on by people who know how to produce a commercial. I'm talking about what really breaks your heart. What breaks your heart so deeply and profoundly that you absolutely must do something about it. When you identify that, you'll identify probably your call in life. You'll identify why you should be here. You'll, you'll identify why you should do this, why you should sacrifice, why you should give your time, why you should give your energy. And once you identify that, then the pain is just the pain. You're going to do what you're going to do, and it doesn't matter if it hurts. It doesn't matter if it's tough. It doesn't matter if it's difficult. You're going to do it. Why? Because it hurts less than your broken heart. And so you're going to chase this. That's what we've got. The first thing we're going to ask is, what does my heart break for? Because what my heart break for, breaks for establishes what I am. What I am establishes what I see. 
and what I see establishes what I will build. So let me, let me take you through this. Let's do the first one. All of these examples are going to be out of the life of Jesus because Jesus is the only perfect human that covers all these. Quite frankly, I'm not sure all, any one of us would cover all these, but Jesus did. So, so, so let me show you this. It, it, Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. Uh, in the story, uh, Jesus comes home and he finds that Peter's, he's at Peter's house. He comes to Peter's house and he finds that Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him. In other words, Jesus walks in and he sees he sees this family in turmoil. Listen, we think in term, we think these days in terms of, oh, it's just a fever. Give her some Tylenol, she'll be fine. <laughs> this is first century. There's no Tylenol. There's no medication. A fever, a simple flu would just kill. And, and so, so she is sick. She is in danger. And Jesus comes in and sees, watch, the family of his friend struggling because they're afraid they're about to lose the mother-in-law. So watch, his heart breaks in this moment for a friend. This is, this is his friend, and it's his family. His friend is hurting because their family is in danger of losing one of their beloved members. And so Jesus' heart breaks for Peter's family because Jesus is his friend. Watch, when, I, when my heart breaks for a friend, it just makes me human. Can I, can I be honest? All humans fall in this category. It, 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 let me be very honest. If, if your heart doesn't break for a friend when a friend is in trouble, wow, you, you, you need to go see somebody because that, that, there's deeper issues going on here. Your heart breaks for your friends. When your friends are in trouble, you go help them. When your friends are in trouble, you, it, it makes, that's what part of what makes you human is the fact that my heart breaks for my friends. Now watch. If, if I'm broken for a friend, that makes me human. That means I see, when I look at my friends, I see these are my people. All of us have those moments. We get in a group of friends. We get in a, in a group of family. We're sitting around. Uh, every, everybody's enjoying one another. And you just have this moment where you just kind of sit back and you say, wow, these are my people. And that's a great moment. Th those are huge moments. They usually happen around food or they happen you know, out in the yard or something. But, uh, but, but the truth is those moments are when you see my people. That's why. Because this is where I belong. This is who I belong to. So watch. If my heart breaks for a friend, then I am human. I see my people. I will build a small group. Now, a small group may be a family. It could be a church. It could be, it could be any number of things. It could be a community group. But, but these are my people. And, and I build this small group that is very tight and it, and it holds each other together. Can I be honest? All of the largest churches in the world are simply a, a, a collaboration of a number of small groups that hold each other accountable and hold each other together. Small groups take care of each other. And inside of large churches, the small groups inside of large churches is, is where the ministry actually happens. You will always, communities are broken down this way. Communities are broken down into a neighborhood or into, or into a block or into a house or into a family. And then the truth is we, our, our groups get smaller and smaller as we go along, but it's the smaller groups that hold society together. I need you to understand this because some of you, as we think about leadership, you will diminish the value of this first one. Don't do that. Don't do that. This is, this is, the, this is the building stone for all the rest of it. So don't diminish that. In fact, again, there's not better or worse here. There's just different. And so if this is where you are, can, can you watch. Some people will never leave this level. This is their level of leadership. And they're good at it. And, and when, when someone finds this as their level of, of leadership, when someone finds this as the place where they find meaning, that should never in any way be diminished or in any way be looked at as less important than any of the others. It literally is the foundation on which all the others get built. So we need to understand that each of these are highly important. So if you're in this first category, then you're going to build a small group. Now look, the next one, 
the next one we find is in is in um is Jesus in Luke chapter 7 verses 12 through 15 and in in Luke chapter 7 verses 12 through 15 what Jesus does is Jesus begins to let me let me jump to a new screen here he says and he approached the town gate watch this and a dead person was being carried out so Jesus is on his teaching ministry and he's approaching a new city and he sees a group of people carrying a dead man this was a boy, and it was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. A large crowd from the town was with her, and when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. Watch this. His heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. So he said, don't cry. i got to get to the next screen. Then he went up, and he touched the pier where they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Luke chapter 7, verses 12 to 15. You see, what we find here is that Jesus' heart is broken, watch, for a stranger. Look, look, he didn't, there's no indication in scripture that he'd ever met this woman before. In fact, this may be his first time visiting this town. Don't know that, but it, it could be. He doesn't know this lady. But what he walks up and he sees is a funeral procession with a young man who has died. His mother is beside him. This is her only son, and she is a widow. Let's put all this together. You're going, oh, it's awful. She lost her son. You're right. It's horrible. It's deeper than that. There's not just family loss here. There's societal position lost. There's security, financial security loss. All of this is lost because in Jesus' day, women couldn't own property. Women couldn't own things. And so what was going on was she's a widow already. So her husband owned everything. He died. Ownership of everything her husband had went to their oldest son, not to her, but to their oldest son. Now, since the oldest son has died, and that's her only son, ownership of that will now go to the closest brother of the man who died, of her, of her, of her husband who died. So all of a sudden, everything she owned is about to be owned by her in-laws. Now, I don't know, maybe that works in your situation, but in a lot of situations, that would be a nightmare. And that's what she's facing. She has no real security in the world. Jesus' heart breaks for a stranger. Listen to me. If your heart breaks for a stranger, then what it makes you is a rescuer. You're someone that wants to rescue people. You you, you probably, if this is you, you're, you're constantly bringing people to stay in the house because they don't have anywhere to go. And maybe you're rescuing animals. Maybe you're rescuing dogs and cats. But maybe you're rescuing humans. And what you're doing is you're rescuing. You see those people. Why those people? Because they're not my people. They're a little, they're a little more, they're, they're a little more disconnected than that. They're not my people. Don't need me to constantly lift them up. But people that need to be rescue, rescued, I have to constantly lift them up. It, it's those people. Don't you see those people? Don't. That, this is what a rescuer would say. They'd look at all the rest of us and say, "Don't you see those people? How can you miss those people? How can you not see those people?" Here, here, you hear how that works. What you will build is a rescue mission. What you will build is rescue mission. Why? Because that's what's breaking your heart. That's the thing that's breaking your heart that you just can't get past. Now, Jesus saw this and he reacted by raising the woman's son from the dead. He gave her back, not just her son, he gave her back her financial security. He gave her back her position in society. He gave her back her life by giving her back his life. Jesus understood that, and he was a rescuer the way rescuers really ought to work. So then, then, then we go and listen to this next story. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him, and two blind men were sitting by the roadside. Remember, there's not social security. There are not safety nets. People who are disabled are just, they have to beg. That's all they can do. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder. 
Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called him. What do you want me to do for you? Can I just pause and as a sidebar say, if God ever asks you, what do you want me to do for you? You need to know the answer to that question. If any leaders around you ever ask you that, you need to know the answer to that question. Figure out the answer to the question. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes, and immediately they received their sight and followed him. Have you noticed that in each of these, we're talking about Jesus had compassion for them. Jesus' heart went out to them. Over and over again, it's an emotional response from the God of heaven toward humanity. I just, I just want to point that out. Look, in this case, he sees a problem. These men cannot make a living. They cannot take care of themselves. They're blind. There's, there's no way they can do anything to help themselves. They're, they're trapped in this situation. Jesus sees the problem. He looks at it and says, look, if I give them back their sight... They'll be able to get jobs. They'll be able to hold their family together. They'll be, able to, they'll be able to feed their kids. They'll be able to move forward. They can move on in society. If I can just get, if I can fix this one thing. So he sees the problem. He fixes it. If you are a person whose heart breaks for a problem, you can see the problem in somebody's life and you're going to fix that problem, that makes you a counselor. That doesn't mean you should go and get a counseling practice. It makes you a counselor, whatever that might mean. That might mean an advisor. That might mean a, a, a life coach. That might mean any number of things. That might mean a manager. It, it could be any number of things. But, but what you're really doing is you're identifying the problem and then identifying how to solve the problem. Because quite frankly, there's often one problem. If I solve this problem, all the other problems will cascade. So that, so that this problem solves all of them. If you are capable of seeing that, you're really falling in the category of a counselor. Now, what you will see is these people. Watch. My people, that's tight. That's in my house, right? Those people, they're over there. Okay? They're those people. We're, we're, don't you see those people? These people aren't over there, but they're not in my house. They're, they're, they're closer than, than, than if I'm a rescuer. They're closer to me than that, but they're still, I'm still not taking them home at night. So it's not my people, but it's, but it's closer than it was with, the, with those people. And so what you'll build is a support group. You're going to build a group of people that will support each other and give answers to problems so that they can solve the problems together. Think about how a support group works. A support group or a cohort group or a, or a leadership uh, growth group, any of those types of grow, groups come together and what they do is they solve problems together. They become counselors for one another so that problems can get solved. You see, these support groups lift each other up and they carry each other. And if you are one who can see a problem, then quite frankly, what you might be is the facilitator, whatever this group might be called, of a support group. You say, well, why would you say a manager? Good managers are people who can sit in a room with the employees around them, look at the issues in each of the employees' workspace, and see the problem and define an answer in a short period of time. That's a good manager. Good managers are not the ones who demand, you do this and you do that and you do that. That's a dictator. A good manager is someone that can manage the issues of the people that he works with, he or she works with. And when she sees those problems, she comes in and she says, hey, I know you're working at this, but do this. Years ago, I was at, uh, I was at, I, I, years ago, y'all, years ago, my first job was at Pizza Hut. And I was doing something, I can't remember what it was, I'd set up my workspace a certain way. And my manager came back and looked at me and said, can I show you something? And I said, what? He said he moved the things I was working with into a different order. He said, now do it. Now, it worked just as well the way I had it. But what he did was he removed like four or five steps that I had to take each time I repeated the action. By doing that, he increased my productivity probably about 30 or 40 percent. Now, at the time, I didn't think about it. I, I, was, I, was, I was 16, 17, 18 years old. I don't remember, 16, 17 years old, probably. But looking back on it, I began to realize what he just did was he taught me how to serve our customers more efficiently by simply changing the order of things I was doing so I would cut down on steps I had to take to get it done. That's 
a good manager. He saw the problem and he found the answer to it. Now, in Matthew chapter 14, we get another one. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. In this story, Jesus has just learned that uh, John the Baptist has been executed. He's been murdered. And, um, and Jesus, this is family for him. They're cousins. And Jesus is, um, is heartbroken by it, quite frankly. And he goes, he goes to get away from people just to be alone for a little while. But the crowds, watch, hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, watch, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Again, you get this compassion thing. So, look, I'm broken for a friend. I am a human. I see my people small group. I'll build a small group. Broken for a stranger. I am a rescuer. I see those people. I'll build a rescue mission. My heart's broken for a problem. I am a counselor. I see these people. I'm going to build a support group. Now, Jesus' heart is broken for a crowd. He looks out and he sees this crowd. Now, watch. Watch. Stay with me. This crowd has shown up because they know of Jesus and they want to experience something of Jesus. So I'm going to say this makes him in this moment a pastor. A pastor's heart breaks for a crowd that's in front of him. He will see our people. How many times have you been in church and you heard, you heard a pastor talk about our people? He will see our people. And what's he going to build? He's going to build a church. Now, this church can have, this, this, this could be in any area of life. A church is a larger group of people broken up into smaller groups and they come together for a singular purpose uh, and they get together on a, on a given regular basis for a singular purpose. They accomplish that purpose and then they move on. So in church, we know that purpose is to worship and to hear the word. But quite frankly, it could be a community group. It could be a book club. It could be anything like this that's a larger crowd, but it has a singular purpose. Now watch. When this happens, what Jesus builds is a core group of people who share an experience. And in sharing this experience of Jesus healing their sick on this, on this, on this hillside, they become bound to one another. And they build a church. Now I want to show you the last one. The last one. Listen to, the, listen to this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages. Uh, all the towns and villages there. Teaching in their synagogues. And proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds. He had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd. When he saw the crowds. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. In this case, Jesus' heart is broken for, you know what? I put the word city there. Quite frankly, his heart is broken for an entire nation. I put the word city there because I think for most of us, thinking of our entire city it's pretty huge. Uh, that, that's beyond what we've ever thought. If you're a pastor, just thinking outside the walls of your church is difficult. And yet, I'm convinced that what we're called to be is the pastors of an entire city, an entire area, an entire county, an entire region, if you will. So Jesus sees the city. I am a, now stay with me. Do not get caught up in the word leader. You say, well, that's what I want to be. That's what this is all about. I want to be this. No, no, no. No, 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 stop. I'm putting the word leader there because I really don't have a better word that the world can attach to. I could put the word apostle. I could put the word savior. I could put any of those words. But the truth is leader is the word that captures this. That doesn't mean you don't lead in any of these. Nor does it mean that the leader does not uh, act like a human or rescue or do any, you see what I'm saying? The truth is we are, this leader's the word I use here. Because what you're going to do is you're going to try to coalesce the energy of an entire city, an entire region, an entire county. You're going to look out and you're not going to see my people, those, the, those people, these people, our, our people. You're going to see God's people. And then you're not going to build a small group, or rescue mission, support group, or church. You're going to build a movement. Now watch. Your movement will likely, invo- will likely include churches, support groups, rescue missions, and small groups. Okay? All of these may fall under here. This one movement will have all of those aspects. In fact, a church will have support groups, rescue missions, and small, and small groups. You see, this? these three will exist inside of these two. And you say, well, well, then I definitely want to be in these two. Well, look, look, look. 
Don't ask what you want to be in. Ask what God created you for. Ask yourself, if your heart breaks for strangers, but you try to lead a city, you're going to be terribly frustrated. You, 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 will be, you will find it frustrating. You won't find success in it. it it'll, it'll ruin your career. However, if your heart breaks for a crowd and you try to, if your heart breaks for a crowd and you try to be a problem solver, a counselor, if you're a pastor and you try to be a counselor, hey, pastors, they all tell you that you're supposed to be a counselor, but no, that's not the same thing. If you're this and you try to be that, then you're, you're going to be frustrated. Now watch, I'm going to show you something else. Pastors, churches, listen. I know of hundreds of churches that are really just small groups. I know of dozens of churches that are rescue missions. I know of dozens of churches that are really just support groups. I know of dozens of churches that act just like churches. And I know a few, just a few churches that have actually become movements. You see what I'm saying? In the end, if we're talking church world, you will make your church look like what God designed your heart to break for. If we're talking world world, outside the church world, then you need to understand which one of these you are and learn to lead up and lead better no matter which area God has designed you to live in. The truth is there's not better or worse. There's just different. And listen, I named this book The Heart of a Leader. And the reason I named it The Heart of a Leader is I'm convinced that's where leadership is born. I think it's born in your heart. Because I think when you define what your heart breaks for, I think when you do that, what, what's going to happen is you're going to understand the area God made you to work in. You're going to find fulfillment. If you're, if, if you're, if you're a rescuer, you're going to find fulfillment in rescuing people. You'll find nothing but frustration in, in these other places. Quite frankly, we're all in the first category. But these next categories... Listen, you ask the Holy Spirit to show you where your heart is. Show you where your heart breaks. Show you how you de He designed your heart. And when you discover that, you will learn how to be who God made you to be. You are a fine child. Learn to be that.